The Holy Gospel for this Reformation Sunday comes to us from the Gospel according to St. Luke, reading from the 19th chapter, beginning with the first verse. And I want to draw to your attention that I'm reading a slightly different translation. This is the RSV as opposed to the NRSV. This is the newer and apparently better, but I want you to listen carefully as you read the text up there and listen to what I'm saying for the differences. There's a very slight difference, but it's extremely important. And you'll all get points if you get this right. <laughs> Luke 19, beginning at the first verse. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not on account of the crowd, because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The other day I was kind of amused by something that Elias said, my son. He was referring to Megan, Jonah's wife, when he said to her, You are the youngest old person I've ever met. And, I mean, it was quite funny, the reason for which he said that, but what was even more amusing to me is that the last time I heard that, it was in reference to me when I was 12 years old. But I had a good reason for it. Over the years, when I was younger, I had decided that I would devote myself to, for the purposes of school, to learning the slide roll. How many people here used the slide roll? Boy, if we could add up all those years. Um, <laughs> I learned the slide rule. I, I knew why it had been developed in the way that it was. I knew how it had happened. John Napier in the 17th century had developed this thing on the basis of logarithms, and I knew that with multiplication, multiplication division, uh, trigono trigonometric functions, and all this kind of stuff, I could use a slide rule, and I became very proficient at it, and I could describe why it did what it did. Nobody else knew how to do that, even those who knew how to use the thing. And the net result of all this was that I was a fairly impressive character to all the young girls, which, of course, was not a bad thing. I knew how to use the slide rule, but then in 1972, a very strange thing began to happen. Pocket calculators came out. <laughs> and it was difficult for me because, you know, I, I was a bit of a, um, a nut for Mr. Spock, and he used computers all the time, but for some reason, I resisted this. I had a lot of investment in the slide rule. I'd spent a lot of time learning this silly thing and perfecting my use of it, and I just wasn't going to get a pocket calculator. I thought it was a fad that would go away. Um, do I sound like anybody here? I wasn't going to do it. I decided that I wasn't the kind of person that needed to have such a thing. Besides which, the only people that had them were the rich kids, because in those days they were very expensive, and some teachers. But slowly but surely, as time passed, these things got less and less and less expensive. But yet I resisted the change until I did. I changed. I don't know what happened. There was no particular decision on my part. I wasn't expecting to change. I 
didn't think that I would change ever, but even beyond my expectation, without any thought of why I changed, all of a sudden I had changed. And part of it had to do with the 1977 advent of personal computers, the Commodore VIC-20, the Commodore 64, and every single one after that I had in my possession. I started university with a, a typewriter because that's all there was, a very, very attractive little Underwood that was in a small plastic carry case like this. But then slowly but surely, I had to be on the cutting edge of computers and found myself by default using electronic calculators. The change had occurred without my making any kind of conscious effort to do it. Not what we would expect. It wasn't what I expected of myself, because I was pretty determined to stick with the slide rule. In our text today, we hear the story that sometimes I believe is misinterpreted. We hear a story of a man whose lot in life was one that we would all consider to be pretty predictable, Zacchaeus. Now, the one thing that we know about Zacchaeus is that he was short. Now, this particular issue I have in common with Zacchaeus, and so therefore, I've always had some fondness for Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus was short and wanted to see Jesus. But he was hated by people, generally hated, partly in, me in some measure because of his status and undoubtedly because of his history, some of the things that he may have done. He was the chief tax collector. So that meant that by definition, he probably stole from people. He probably extorted money from people that he ought not to have taken. He squeezed them for more money than he was entitled to get, and he was known as a sinner, and nobody liked him. But quite beyond his expectations, something had changed in Zacchaeus' head, in Zacchaeus' life, and he wanted to see Jesus. So he climbed a tree because he knew Jesus was going to pass by that way. And much to his surprise, thinking that he very likely would be invisible, all of a sudden, Jesus saw him. Not only did Jesus saw him, he went directly to him, looked up into the tree, into the sycamore tree, and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. I need to stay at your place today. Of course, he came down and he was overjoyed that he had been noticed, that he'd been seen by the Lord. Now, this was not what the people expected. If anything, Jesus noticing Zacchaeus should have brought out in Jesus a tirade of condemnation. For Zacchaeus was a sinner. And they all absolutely in their minds knew that. They'd written him off. He wasn't the kind of person that any self-respecting Jew of the day would want to associate with. He was not the kind of person, certainly, that the Savior would want to associate with. He was not the kind of person that this important teacher, Jesus, should be associating with. And yet there he was going into his house. So people were beginning to murmur, partly against Zacchaeus, but more importantly, against Jesus, because of what Jesus had decided to do, to go in to the house of Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus stood up, and he said, Lord, I want to read this part to you again, because this is where the difference comes, and I hope you are paying attention to the text, because it is indeed an important difference. He said, Lord, behold, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Did anybody notice the difference? What was the difference? Will. Future tense. For some reason, many, many translators of this particular passage, including the NRSV, have chosen to utilize what they call a future present tense. Now, I, as a person who studied Greek for a very long time, I have a great problem with this because the future present tense, even if it can arguably be said to be something that might be reasonable, exists nowhere else in the New Testament. In other words, they have made this up they have created a grammatical rule in order to make the story be more like what they expect. 
let me explain a little further. This man, Zacchaeus, he was not saying, clearly not saying, I will give half of my belongings or I will restore fourfold if I've defrauded anyone of anything. He's saying, I already doing this. This is what I'm doing. Now, we don't know why he started to do that. If we assume that he was the kind of sinful chief tax collector that he was reputed to be and had been at some point in his life stealing from people and extorting from people, we don't know at what point he began to change. But at that point in time, when he was motivated to see Jesus, he was already doing it. Lord, I give half of all my belongings away. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Not I will, but I do. This is not what the people expected to hear. And Jesus said in response to this, today salvation has come into this man's house. Son of Abraham that he is. Now, traditionally, uh, uh, theology very often wants to make of this story a story of sin and repentance. But it's curious, don't you think, that neither Jesus nor Zacchaeus mention sin or repentance. It's just the crowd that's assuming that this man is a horrible and awful sinful person, that there needs to be some repentance. In fact, they expect there to be some punishment. They want to see him suffer as they themselves have suffered at the hands of tax collectors. But somewhere along the line, and we don't know why or how, it's beyond our expectations, Zacchaeus changed. He changed. Probably not even what he expected. And he wanted to see Jesus. And the miracle in this story truly is that it, it comes in the seeing. It comes in the recognition, the notice that Jesus made of Zacchaeus. It wasn't about his proclamation that I give or I restore, or even with the new translation saying I will give or I will restore. It wasn't about that. It was about simply Zacchaeus got to see Jesus. And he recognized in that moment in time very, very clearly that Jesus noticed him. Jesus saw him, and that filled him with joy. Brothers and sisters, 499 years ago tomorrow, Martin Luther affixed to the doors of the Castle Church in Wittenberg his 95 Theses, which marked the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Now, at that point in time, it probably wasn't that big of a deal. He was putting up a notice for debate. But think of the changes that have taken place because Martin Luther recognized that God was not what he had been expecting all along. He was thinking of God as a God of absolute righteousness and purity and justice and what he was learning, what he had learned through the Apostle Paul from this text in Romans that John read to us. What he learned was that God was all about love for us. God is righteous and his expectation for us is based on his love for us. God loves us, brothers and sisters, pure and simple. And though we are called upon to be as righteous as we can be by God's grace, the first and most important thing for any of you to remember is that God loves you. There is a story that is told of a pastor who talked to his youth group and said, what do you think God thinks of you? And the surprising answer was that most of the teenagers said, that God is disappointed in me. That God is disappointed in me because I can't be what I should be. We have changed, just as the translators of the NRSV have done, we've changed it to suit our understanding or our expectations of who it is that God should be. We still teach ourselves, we still teach our families that God is a God of righteousness who demands from us 
righteousness and miss a very important step. The most important of steps, that God loves us as we are. Brothers and sisters, God is not disappointed in you. When God looks at you, he thinks of nothing but his love for you. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And this is what gives us hope. This is what gave Martin Luther hope. This is why, in his mind, in his eyes, heaven opened up when he made this discovery, because God was not a harsh judge who was there to condemn him, but a loving father who was there to embrace him. Now, my prayer for you is that you go out from this place and reflect on this. That you go out from this place and think about what it means that your God and your Father loves you so much that he saved you from your sins. He loves you so much that he's done for you what you cannot do for yourselves. I want you to think about this and internalize this. God is God of love, not of condemnation. In addition to making you feel more comfortable in your own skin about this, the more important and compelling reason for which I want you to hear this message is because the world needs to hear it. And you are the messengers. You can go out from this place and proclaim to a brother or sister who feels or understands that God is disappointed in them. You can make the proclamation that God loves them and you will change their lives. For in that instant, you will be God's hands in the world, doing God's work. So go out from this place and remember, our God is a God of love, first and foremost. And once you know that in your heart, once you're excited about that and feel that, share it. Because all around you, there are people that need to hear it. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks this day that we are your children. That we are your children who know from you only love, not condemnation. Bless us and grant us such a knowledge of that love that we are impelled to go out from this place and proclaim that good news to all the world so that all people might come to a saving knowledge of your grace. In your name we pray. Amen.